Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. This day, um, we have with us um, Benjamin Gilbert and Ben Beard uh, from Red Hat, and they're going to be talking about Fedora CoreOS, or FCOS, or however you want to pronounce that acronym. And I'm going to let the two of them um, introduce themselves and um, give us a bit of background on the beginnings and the origins and what is um, Fedora CoreOS and how it interrelates with everything. Um, that we're doing with OpenShift and OKD. So take it away, Benjamin. Thank you, Diane. I am Benjamin Gilbert. Um, I was originally uh, a, an engineer on the Container Linux team uh, back at CoreOS Incorporated. Um, I actually still work on Container Linux a little bit, and I also work on Fedora CoreOS, where I'm a technical lead. Fantastic. Uh, Hey everybody, my name is Ben Briard. I am uh, one of the product managers here at Red Hat. Uh, got about nine years in here, so I'm I'm getting old. Um, I my primary focus these days is strictly uh, all the work we're doing around um, Fedora and RHEL Core OS. I do also work uh, with some of the other teams on the on the RHEL and OpenShift side, but primary focus is is everything we're going to be talking about today. So thank you guys for, for making some time. Uh, we're going to really get into the high levels around um, around kind of what what Fedora Core OS is. Uh, we're excited. Obviously, hopefully you guys saw the announcement that the user preview is available. Um, you know, we definitely want everybody to try that out and take a look. Um, and then I'll go over uh, really some kind of set some context for what we're doing here, and then. Benjamin's going to uh, going to go down a level uh, into some some deeper details, and then uh, at the end we should have plenty of time for questions if anybody if anybody has those. Uh, so with Fedora Core OS, we are pursuing uh, a new edition of Fedora. If you're familiar with um, how this works on the Fedora side, uh, today the primary two are server and workstation, um, where they they are kind of use case focused. So when you do an install out of the box, you typically get a content set or something that is a, a little bit more tailored for what you're going to be using it for. Um, and and with Fedora Core OS, we we're, we're definitely pursuing a more opinionated um, build of the operating system to run uh, specifically containerized workloads. Um, so we'll get into what what we're doing to actually make that easier and better uh, for everybody. Um, and and what we, when we approached this, we really, we really sat down and laid out all the various projects and technology uh, here that that was in, you know, being used in the past from, you know, things like Container Linux and Atomic Host. And it was, this was like, I don't know, probably the highlight of my career here at Red Hat was really taking like, what's working really well, how do we bring those things forward, um, and then taking a look at maybe some things that aren't working so well that there's a lot of room for improvement on and how do we how do we plot that path forward so um anyway so that's and what you're going to see today is really kind of the the result of of that work um so we are kind of bringing forward some pieces of uh of atomic host uh, but this offering will will basically deprecate uh atomic so from a mission statement uh, our goal here is to create an automatically updating minimal monolithic container focused operating system designed for clusters, but also operable standalone. So we are optimized for Kubernetes, but also great without it. Um, and, and at the highest level, if you are familiar with uh, CoreOS Container Linux, you can, you can think of Fedora CoreOS as, as that successor. Um, very similar uh, from a usability perspective and use case coverage. Uh, it's that same same type of mentality behind the OS. And then really quickly, I want to cover uh, kind of the the product side and how you know kind of how RHEL Core OS is different. Um, and many people are very comfortable with the split between RHEL and Fedora. Um, RHEL, you know, basically we cut from Fedora, um, you know when we're ready for a major release of RHEL. So it is effectively the upstream for RHEL. Uh, RHEL Core OS kind of shares that same, um, a similar lineage uh, with, with Fedora Core OS. Um, however, uh, we're much more opinionated on, on the use cases for RHEL Core OS. So you can see here, it's not intended to be a standalone OS. It is literally built with 
OpenShift and is a component of that. So the cluster is meant to manage the operating system. And we have really powerful operators for that, specifically the machine config operator, which if you haven't heard of that, I definitely would recommend that you go you go read about that. Um, but uh, we do, uh, we, we build this from RHEL 8 and it, it is shipped version tested and just it's a core component of OpenShift. Now, Fedora CoreOS uh, shares, um, it, it basically serves as um, kind of an upstream to RHEL CoreOS from that shared component space. So these are tooling that goes uh, specific to CoreOS, which we'll, we'll, we'll get into what these components are in a little bit. Um, but that's how these two are related. So uh, some of the common DNA between them, how they're built, the tooling, the build tools, uh, the pipelines, these types of things are, are common. Uh, but again, Fedora CoreOS is meant to, to have a, a, you know, a wider aperture of, of use cases around it. So it, it is great in a standalone fashion. Um, and it does give you kind of that, that latest um, uh, like Linux content that you know, Fedora is, is known for. And with that as kind of some context okay. here, I'm going to go so, ahead and yeah, turn it over to you. Take it away. <laughs> cool. Um, so there were several sort of high-level design principles that went into um, how we think about both Fedora CoreOS and RHEL CoreOS. Um, and uh, I guess the principal one is immutable infrastructure. Uh, this is not something that's embodied in code uh, as such. It's just how we think about how a um, container, how a fleet of container hosts uh, should be managed. And the idea here is just that um, you, whatever customizations you need to do to the host, whether it's setting a host name or static IP addressing or configuring um, security settings or whatever, is all encoded in a single provisioning config file. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and then once that provisioning config is used to spin up a node, um, you don't touch that node anymore. It automatically updates itself, it runs containers, um, it schedules, uh, Kubernetes schedules pods onto it, uh, but you don't SSH in and modify things, uh, you don't use configuration management to uh, update the settings. We don't stop you from doing those things uh, in Fedora Core OS but we discourage it. Uh, what, what we think you should do instead is update the provisioning config and spin up a new node and spin down the old one. Um, and the idea there is just that the provisioning con config always is the uh, source of ground truth for how nodes should look. Uh, and so if you need to scale out your system, you just throw the provisioning config at new nodes and then don't have to think about it further. Uh, a second major component of the philosophy is that uh, all software that uh, is relevant to a user should run in a container. Um, we provide software for supporting hardware or mounting iSCSI uh, uh, storage devices, that kind of thing. But if you want to ship custom code to the nodes, uh, it should run in a container. In pursuit of that, we don't ship interpreters. We have Bash and Awk, if you want to think of that as an interpreter. We don't ship Python. Uh, there's no Perl or anything like that. And we don't worry about um, API compatibility for the libraries that we ship in the host. Uh, because again, that's essentially implementation detail of the host um, and uh, user software should run in containers. And then finally, another implementation detail uh, is the OS version itself. The OS releases are versioned um, on, for both Fedora CoreOS and RHEL CoreOS. Uh, because that's useful for debugging. But the process of upgrading between releases should be completely transparent and happen behind the scenes. Um, in particular, the upgrade from, let's say, Fedora 30 to Fedora 31 should be completely transparent. Um, that shouldn't be a big deal. The, the node should just upgrade, and, uh, and that's that. Right, next slide, please. So, okay, what is the thing we're actually building? Um, it's a distro for servers and clouds. Um, we're not here yet, but we want to uh, run in a variety of clouds, uh, AWS, GCP, Azure, DigitalOcean, um, some others. Um, it, it's sort of a cloud-first distro. Uh, running on bare metal in, in virtualization is absolutely a first-class citizen, um, but we think of the OS as a cloud would, if that makes any sense. 
Uh, workloads running containers, as I mentioned, which means that the OS is pretty minimal. It doesn't have a lot of uh, administrative tooling, that kind of thing. Um, and it is an image-based distro uh, using RPM OS tree. If you're not familiar with RPM OS tree, you can think of it as Git for your operating system. Um, it maintains uh, individual operating system releases as commits effectively, and you uh, download a commit and uh, apply it um, essentially in a separate directory and then reboot into it. Um, so where the bullet says offline automatic uh, offline atomic updates, that's what it's talking about. You download a, a, the delta between what you're running and what you want to run and then reboot into it. The operating system itself is read only, so you can't go in and modify something in user SBIN, for example. Um, over and above what RPM OS tree provides, we provide automatic updates, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Next slide. Um, okay, I already mentioned this a little bit. Uh, we're targeting a variety of cloud platforms. We are doing our best not to ship cloud platform agents. So several clouds, um, Azure and GCP, for example, um, tend to prefer that they have software running directly on the host operating system. Um, that software provides some useful functionality. It also provides uh, a number of things that are not especially useful in the context of a minimal uh, container-focused operating system. So in general, we are trying to avoid shipping those platform agents. I, I'm not sure that we will always be successful, but that's the idea. Um, sometimes when very minimal amounts of functionality are needed, uh, for example, on some platforms, uh, the operating system needs to tell the cloud that it's done booting. Um, that's the thing we can do in, in generic code that we maintain. So we have this uh, project called Afterburn, which uh, is a so, sort of a generic minimal cloud agent. It has uh, hooks for things like checking into the cloud to report that the boot is done, asking the cloud questions about what the public IP address for the node is, things like that. Uh, and wherever possible, we will, we will put functionality in Afterburn rather than shipping a, a whole separate agent. Next slide. Um, on the bare metal side, um, we think of bare metal as an extension of, of cloud images. So uh, on the cloud, you, you have an AMI ID or something, and you just launch the, the image you want. There's no installer. So on the bare metal side, there shouldn't really be an installer either. Uh, the way you get Fedora Core OS onto disk is there's a script, and it essentially downloads a monolithic um, disk image and DDs it to disk. Um, we will eventually support live Pixie as well. So you can network boot um, a Fedora Core S image and run it entirely from RAM. People do this on container Linux today as, as a way of actually running container host in production. Uh, we don't support that yet in the current uh, Fedora Core S preview release, but we will support it soon. Next slide. Uh, okay, so what are we actually shipping in Fedora Core OS? Um, it's Fedora-based components, kernel, systemd, um, Podman and Mobi for container engines, and uh, whatever software is necessary for, for basic support of your hardware. We are shipping basic administration tools. Uh, you can SSH into the node and run journal control, things like that. Um, a little bit further down the road, uh, we are talking about uh, the best way to or provide access to things like the Kubelet and Cryo, uh, but we're not quite there yet. Next slide. Okay, um, so let's talk a little bit more about provisioning. So we have a uh, component called Ignition. It has been used in Container Linux for, I don't know, two or three years now. Um, and it is the way that you get customizations into a Fedora Core OS machine. So you write an ignition, well, I'll get to that a little bit more in a bit. Uh, you have an ignition config, um, which is a JSON document, which uh, specifies how you want the resulting machine to look. And you provide the ignition config to a node via user data. So most clouds have a mechanism for passing in small amounts of arbitrary data uh, to uh, an instance. Um, in the cloud, you use that. On bare metal, uh, you can put the ignition config on a web server and pass a URL on the kernel command line. So uh, on first boot, Ignition runs very early in the boot. 
uh, in the init ramfs actually and uh, fetches the ignition config and applies it and then continues the boot um, it can be to write files write system d units um, create users and groups and because we run so early, we can do more interesting things as well. Uh, we can partition your disks. We can create RAID arrays, format file systems. Um, and essentially, all this runs before the, what you would think of as the real boot actually starts. And so when we're doing things like writing system D units, um, that is safe because system D hasn't calculated the dependency set yet. Um, and so we're not doing this thing where we sort of try to reconfigure the boot while in the middle of the boot already. Um, so that's nice for, from a reliability perspective. And it also means that if the ignition config cannot be implemented for some reason, um, perhaps we're trying to format a file system on a device that doesn't exist, we can just fail the entire boot. So what that means is if your machine boots successfully, you know that the ignition config has been correctly applied. Next slide. So where do ignition configs come from? Um, they are JSON documents. JSON is kind of messy to edit by hand. Um, and ignition configs are pretty low level. They're, they don't provide any uh, nice language for, you know, please set my time zone to X. Instead, you're, you're writing a file in Etsy. Um, so we provide um, a layer of what we call sugar on top. Uh, and this is the Fedora Core OS config language. It's YAML, uh, so it's a little bit easier to edit. And it provides all the low-level functionality that the ignition config does. Uh, but it also provides a uh, nice syntax for doing common operations, perhaps setting your time zone or um, configuring uh, the update service, things like that. So you write your Fedora Core OS config, um, and then you run it through a program called the Fedora Core OS config transpiler, and it spits out an ignition config, which you would then hand to your machine. The other thing that transpiler is able to do is um, it understands the things that it's converting, and so it can check for common errors. Um, we have some checks now, we'll be adding more over time, uh, but it's a nice opportunity to uh, validate the config before it's ever handed to a machine trying to boot from it. Next slide. Yeah, and really quick, let me jump in here. Um, and so ignition is a pretty deep topic. Uh, you guys will know that historically this this uh, role has been filled with a tool called Cloud Init, uh, which is also still great. Uh, but we've we've made a made a choice to kind of double down the investment around ignition. Um, so the, we'll we'll talk about this at the end as well, but just so you guys are aware, the next comments briefing will have a deep dive just on around ignition. So uh, if anybody's interested in that topic, highly recommend uh, come back there. Cool. Okay, so once you get a machine provisioned, um, how is it updated? We don't think users should have to think about updates. Um, the machine should update itself. That way, you get uh, bug fixes uh, as soon as they're available for, for critical bugs. You get security fixes as soon as they're available. But in order for that to work, in order for users to not turn updates off, um, those updates must be reliable. They cannot break existing nodes, um, either accidentally via regression or intentionally. Um, from time to time, there, it's necessary to make a breaking change to the operating system for one reason or another. And if we're going to do that, um, as a matter of policy, we need to have a long deprecation period first. So people have plenty of advance notice that they should move over to the new thing. Um, okay, how do we actually accomplish that reliability? Uh, several techniques. So first of all, uh, any change to the operating system has to go through automated CI, uh, continuous integration tests. And uh, if the tests don't pass, then the change is not made to the operating system. Um, that's fine as far as it goes, but for something as for something as complex as an entire operating system, um, BI is not going to catch every possible uh, regression. So uh, we have some additional strategies. We have managed update rollout, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more. We have multiple release streams so that there is a way to um, to test changes in a smaller context before they roll out to the entire fleet. 
And as a last resort, if uh, an update rolls out to a machine and it fails to boot successfully, uh, the OS will automatically detect that case and roll back to the previous release. Um, included in that is the ability for the user to specify um, user-provided health checks. So perhaps you have a particular service, and if that service doesn't come up successfully, then that machine is useless to you. You would add that service to the automatic health check, and if there's a failure, then that would trigger an automatic rollback. Next slide. Um, update management. Uh, there was a question in chat, which I'll just answer real quick. The question was, is the cadence the same as uh, Fedora? So uh, I'll talk about it a little bit more when we get to update streams, but um, we we take the Fedora um, current release and then we essentially package it up every two weeks. Update management. Uh, for new installs, we think it's important to have the ability to point users to which release they should use. This derives some from our experience with Container Linux. Uh, a lot of systems, for example, in, uh, embed a particular AMI ID on AWS uh, for which uh, OS image they should launch. Um, mo usually that's the most recent release, but if we do roll out a release and discover that there's a problem that makes it not work correctly on a particular cloud, and this is the thing that's happened to us on Container Linux, um, we feel it's important to be able to tell users that future launches should use uh, one release older while we fix the regression. Similarly, it might be that uh, there's an outage in a particular cloud which makes us unable to roll out a, a release to that cloud, in which case um, a similar sort of thing might be necessary, having different clouds point to different uh, release images. Um, on the update side, um, I mentioned that there's RPM OS tree, and then there's a layer on top of that which drives it. And it calls back to uh, a service run by Fedora, which requests permission to update. Uh, and that permission is granted on a staged rollout sort of basis. Um, so we might say, roll out this update over 24 hours, and some number of percent of uh, nodes would receive that update every hour. And the idea there is just that, again, if there's some critical breaking uh, issue, that we have an opportunity to stop the rollout um, before it hits the entire fleet. Next slide. Uh, okay, release streams. So the stable stream uh, in the middle there is the one that most nodes will probably want to run. Um, but in order to get there, we start with something called the testing stream. So every the current plan is uh, every two weeks, we snapshot current Fedora. So right now, 30. Um, we snapshot that plus updates, and we issue a release on the testing stream. Um, that sits there in the testing stream for two weeks um, so that people have time to report problems with it. Um, then at the end of the two-week period, we take those same bits, we fix any regressions or, or uh, bugs or whatever, and uh, roll out to the stable stream. In addition, we have a third stream called next, which um, the general idea, the implication is a little bit complicated. The, sorry, implementation is a little bit complicated. Uh, but the general idea there is that if Fedora 31 is pretty close to release, the last couple months before Fedora 31 is released, um, we would be releasing that every two weeks on the next stream. Uh, because the bump from 30 to 31 uh, is a larger set of changes, we want to make sure that it has extra time uh, to be deployed and get experience out in the real world. Um, and all of this is toward the goal of making sure uh, we can get bug reports, have a time, uh, an amount of time to fix them before uh, the bugs promote the stable release. Um, so key to this is that uh, every deployment should run a little bit of testing and a little bit of next, perhaps a few percent of, the, of your nodes. Um, because Fedora Core S is intended primarily for clustered applications, um, that should be reasonably safe. If a testing node falls over, then uh, your pods will be rescheduled on other nodes. Um, and by doing this, uh, you have the opportunity to fix, to, to catch, um, 
workload dependent or perhaps hardware or network dependent uh, issues. In order for this to work, we will be backporting security fixes and bug fixes uh, of, of a certain severity to all three streams. So all three should be safe to run in production. Next slide. Um, update coordination. So one other bit of this is that um, if automatic updates are being applied, you don't want your entire cluster to apply the update and reboot simultaneously. Um, so within Zencaddy, the update client, um, there is a provision for the client to connect to some cluster-wide service, which is specified in config, uh, and request permission to update. And then the cluster can give that permission, really means uh, to finalize the update and reboot. The cluster can give that permission um, using whatever criteria it wants. Um, so if it wants to ensure that updates only happen certain hours of the day, it can do that. If it wants to take a lock and make sure that only two nodes can update at once, it can do that. Next slide. Telemetry. Um, our experience with Container Linux, and I think also uh, the experience more broadly in the Fedora project, is that it's hard to know how to direct development efforts if we don't actually know how the OS is being used. At the same time, um, while automatic uh, reporting of, of uh, those sorts of details has become reasonably common in the industry, um, it's also controversial from a privacy perspective. And so we want to make sure that we are um, that we have some information with which to uh, direct development because that makes the OS better. But it's also very important to us that we uh, do that in a way that preserves privacy. So by default, Fedora Core OS will report some telemetry uh, back to the Fedora project. Uh, this will consist by default of completely not identifying uh, information to the extent possible, um, or phrased a different way, uh, information that's generic enough that it shouldn't fingerprint your machine. Um, so things like I'm running on AWS and I'm running uh, a, an M4.large instance type and uh, my current OS version is uh, 123 and uh, the initial installed version of the OS was 120, things like that. Um, and that just helps us know, um, for example, which clouds to, to uh, work on improving first. Um, in addition, you'll be able to specify um, that additional metrics should be sent. So for example, if you're on bare metal, we would be interested in what types of hardware you're running on. But uh, since there's a more diverse set of hardware out there, that uh, might uh, be more likely to identify you. And so uh, you would need to get permission to provide that. And of course, it's possible to completely opt out of metrics, at which point um, your nodes become invisible to us for the purpose of, of directing our development efforts. Um, no unique identifiers will be sent. Uh, this is just a matter of the node will check in, for example, once a day and send its information, but there won't be any UUID or anything to identify the node, no MAC addresses or anything like that. Um, and we will use the data only in aggregate rather than um, picking out individual nodes. Next slide. Uh, so where are we right now? Uh, Fedora Chorus Preview was just released. Um, and you can, all the URLs are in a later slide, uh, but you can um, go to the website and download uh, an AMI ID or download a, a QMU image or a bare metal image and try it out. Um, please don't run it in production yet. It's not quite ready for that. Uh, but play with it, uh, run workloads on it that, that you might want to run um, and see what you think. Uh, please report to us uh, bugs, missing features that you feel are important. Um, and uh, we can work to improve the preview for the stable release, uh, which is in roughly six months. Uh, by the time we, we get to the stable release, uh, after we declare Fedora Core as stable, uh, that means we believe that it's ready to run in production. Uh, one other note with the preview release, um, we are reserving the right for the time being to make incompatible changes. Uh, it is possible that some preview builds will not successfully update to other preview builds um, and manual in intervention will be required. It's possible that um, something like how you configure networking might change. Uh, we're obviously going to try to keep those sorts of changes to a minimum, but uh, we want to be able to, again, make the best release that we can uh, by the time we get to stable. Next slide. 
So um, what is coming up? Currently, we only have the testing stream plus uh, a couple sort of non-production streams for development purposes. So we're going to have uh, Next and Stable um, reasonably soon. We do not yet have um, all of the cloud and virtualization platforms supported. Um, so we're going to be working on providing those as well. Um, we are interested in multi multiple architecture support. So for example, ARM64 is, is one that's of some interest. Um, I mentioned Live Pixie earlier for uh, running the system entirely out of RAM. That is not yet supported. It's uh, a popular option on the container Linux, and so we really want to get that in, uh, but it's not there yet. Same with providing a live CD. Uh, improvements to network configuration. Um, the, among other things, the init RAMFS is currently using Dracut networking rather than Network Manager right now, and uh, some work is needed there. Over time, uh, we're going to provide more um, nice configuration knobs in the Fedora Coros config transpiler so that uh, for common cases, you don't have to manually specify you know, the contents of a particular config file. Um, functioning telemetry, right now, uh, well, actually, as of the next preview release, we will have a telemetry um, client, which is just a stub. It parses the config file so that you can go ahead and disable uh, metrics, for example, if that's what you'd like to do. Um, but aside from pricing the config file and complaining about errors, it doesn't actually do anything yet. So uh, we're going to need to get that fixed. Um, much more documentation and also um, design and integration work uh, for running OKD on, on Fedora Core OS. Next slide. And I believe Ben is back to you. Thank you. Yeah. So. Uh, this is a good topic uh, for us to talk about as it's typically relevant to, to this audience. Um, you guys know OKD is obviously um, kind of the, the community side of OpenShift and with Fedora CoreOS being, you know, kind of the community flavor of real CoreOS, it makes a, a lot of sense uh, to pair these two up, uh, you know, effectively giving you the same, a, a lot of the same benefits of, you know, OpenShift on real CoreOS. Um, where we are right now is, I mean, obviously you have a, a state for where, where Fedora CoreOS is in the project, and of course getting these two things working together. Um, we, uh, you know, I would say we're in the early stages. We we have some some good ideas, um, but we we haven't vetted these fully on the community side, and so that that is ongoing right now. Um, we do know that there will be uh, some changes needed on the installer, and then for the uh, machine config operator as well. Uh, but we haven't quite uh, drawn the lines of if we if we think this should work similar to how uh, kind of Tectonic and Container and Linux had a relationship where the OS just uh, moved on its own cadence underneath the platform, or if it makes more sense to do what we're doing uh, with OpenShift and RHEL Core OS, where the, the cluster actually dictates the OS down, and so you're always versioned and, and consistent across the cluster. Um, the, there's there's obviously pros and cons to each one, um, but I, I do expect us to get this flushed out um, pretty quickly. I don't want to overpromise on dates, but obviously uh, we, we really want to get OKD running up at Oracle CoreOS out sooner than later. Um, so that, that's kind of the big thing is, is where does that control of the versioning happening? Um, in the short term, to probably accelerate this, we're likely going to have a branch of Fedora CoreOS for OKD um, that will just, you know, add in the Kubelet and Cryo, Everybody wins. It just just works. And then the big question is, do we do we do that long term, or do we try to have more native support for OKD directly in the Fedora Core OS? Do we look at some trick ways to change the payload of of you know delivering the Kubelet and Cryo to the OS node? Uh, there there's kind of some some options there that uh, we absolutely want to make sure that we explore and do the due diligence around. So I you know kind of the key point here is it's. Um, on that side, it's a little bit early uh, in the process, but uh, we're going to be working through this uh, you know, in a public way. So if anybody here um, has opinions or comments, definitely please join the discussion uh, around this. And, and also, oh, uh, yeah, to sure. respond to Diane's comment in chat, it's not in the slides, but yes, we are not envisioning that this would wait for the Fedora Core OS stable release. The idea is that we would have something running at least um, well before the stable release. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and and something worth running, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Awesome. Excellent. Um, okay, so how do I get involved? Um, where do you go? So if you want to grab the preview release, it's uh, you know gitfedora.org slash coreOS, um, and you can pick the platform, grab the right the right version if you want to do a VM or bare metal or, or whatever. All of the different flavors are right there and easily accessible. Um, we do have an issue tracker. Um, please, please, please uh, get involved. Let us know feedback, good, bad, or ugly. Um, this is actually one of the things we really wanted to improve uh, from kind of past iterations is uh, more active participation um, on the community and, and just just like visibility and transparency in the, in the process of building this. So, um, you know, we definitely encourage everybody to not only do issues, but, you know, join us on the, on the forums as well. Um, it's a, it's a good setup we have going here. Uh, obviously we're nerds, so we hang out on IRC. Uh, so, you know, feel free to hop into Freenode. Sure many of you are already there. Um, oh yeah. And I didn't call it the develop list, but yeah, you can, you can use that as well. I mentioned the other comments brief or the next comments briefing earlier. Here's the link to it. Um, I, August, Diane, is it August 28th? Yes, well, it is. Yes, okay. it is. Yes, and sorry about that. I thought I was on mute, but I wasn't. Go for no, it. no, not a problem. Yeah, so so August 28th, and, and we'll do a deeper dive in this. And of course, by then, uh, the the FCCT, the Fedora um, Transpiler, will likely have uh, some cool bells and whistles in it, uh, you know, between the next month. So, uh, so that'll be a really cool talk as well. Um, so I'm going to leave this up, and then uh, we'll go ahead and open this up for Q and A. Um, so I can't see the chat, but you know I'll I'll let, leave it to Diane and Benjamin to kind of ask questions or read anything that's in there. Um, and happy to happy to talk about anything that's interesting to you guys. So I I, I have a question uh, myself um, because on the previous slide you said you mentioned the OpenShift installer work cool. and. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, in terms of the OpenShift installer, what's involved in getting a version that works with FCAUSE. And in my dream of dreams, it's just a simple if-then-else statement, and I know that's not true, but um, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about that? Um, uh, yeah. Do you want to take it, Benjamin? Uh, I can take part of it. So I don't actually know the OpenShift installer very well. Um, there was some discussion around um, adding some sort of a, of a command line argument or something so that it knows that it's installing on, on FCOS rather than uh, RHEL core OS. The one bit that I do know um, is still sort of an unresolved issue is there's some details around Ignition and how it's handled on Fedora core OS versus RHEL core OS. Um, there were some incompatible changes made to the Ignition config spec. Um, the spec is versioned and you declare in your ignition config what version you support. Um, the, the spec version we were using on container Linux um, before had some uh, systemic design flaws that needed to be corrected. And the original goal was that those flaws would be corrected um, for both Fedora CoreOS and RHEL CoreOS. But the timing didn't quite work out. And so um, the initial releases of OpenShift 4 are, are still using the, uh, the older incompatible version of Ignition. Um, for Fedora CoreOS uh, with OKD, we are, well, Fedora CoreOS is using the newer um, Ignition config spec. And we are hoping to continue doing that with OKD, which means that the installer and MCO uh, would need to learn about that newer Ignition version. Um, the details of how that works or whether we can make it work are still sort of up in the air. Yeah, but it, I, I will add this too. It's also, it's really good and healthy uh, for us to work through this on this side because we we desperately need to bring in the newer um, the newer spec on OpenShift as well. It, it gives us a lot of a lot of benefits around around RHEL core OS. So um, definitely excited that the work is happening here and, and we'll be able to pull it into the product space um, when it's ready and mature. But yeah, that's the, that's, that's one of the big ones um, on the installer side. Does that help Diane? Yeah, Absolutely. I'd, also add a, I'd also add like some of the details around this is like we, the best place to do this was probably in a forum where we can kind of get the technical proposals because there's a ton of subtle details in the installer, just like Ignition, just like FCAUSE. 
and having that kind of be in a here's the thing that we want to go do and here's all the trade-offs is um, bigger than you could probably just we could probably describe in this meeting yeah absolutely so to then and we're, we're um and look for an announcement shortly but we're going to have a kickoff for an okd working group uh next week um and there will be a there's a survey that's been sent around and i'll, I'll post that with the, the video and the, the slides here too as well um and so maybe some of that conversation could happen there because it's for for okd to work um for 4.0 we really need both the OpenShift installer, the ignition bits, and Fedora CoreOS. So there's some interdependencies that we, we definitely have to talk about as a community and um, make sure they all resolve nicely. Um, th this Pete, so it seems like uh, this sort of branding around Fedora as opposed to thinking of traditional Fedora, right? Like um, Fedora is this expanse of RPM space and that's not really, the, the, the idea here is this is the community uh, core OS for OKD. Is that is that a fair statement? Hmm. Um, I, I would I think at the beginning you set the stage, um, Benjamin or Ben. I'm not sure who had this slide. That this yeah. was. Sorry, I joined late, Diane, so I might have missed. I think it, it's more than just OKD. There are other ARM and other. Um, application so there was a one slide with packet and a bunch of other things where we want to make sure this runs everywhere um, and it's not just an okd specific i think some of these issues are things that okd community people have to step up and and help resolve for okd but there'll be other communities like the arm one that will have um, requests yeah well yeah we'll make correct sure you get the you get the slides and and the recording but but in in short you know, you could think of RPM as, or sorry, Fedora as a massive collection of, of RPMs that kind of move and iterate together. This is a specific edition of Fedora, so it's a very opinionated deployment that's really just targeted towards um, containerized workloads. You can think of it as just, I set my OS in motion. I like to say self-driving marketing tells me not to because it scares people when AI crashes cars, but uh, yeah, the the idea is the OS is kind of self managing, self maintaining. Once you've set it in motion, you really just own deploying your app to it, however it makes sense. Um, which is which is really really different from a traditional Linux box where you know you you update and actively manage that in a different way. So that that's kind of how I would draw the lines between this and Fedora. Sorry, Benjamin, you you were going to add some, right? So. Um... Fedora CoreOS, uh, we were saying earlier, uh, RHEL CoreOS is a component, of course, of OpenShift. It is specifically for OpenShift. Fedora CoreOS is interested in OKD. It's interested in vanilla Kubernetes. It's interested in um, running containers directly from systemd units with Podman. Um, any way that people run containers, uh, we're potentially interested in. Uh, we're trying to, to support automated operations um, underneath any orchestration system or just manually running containers uh, that you might want. Yeah, I think it'll be important messaging uh, to sort of break that sort of mental sort of attachment, you know, like I'm a Fedora packager and uh, it's, it's this really big community that thinks of things in terms of, you know, like the latest rawhide version of XYZ. So... Um, but yeah, I, I get uh, I get what you're saying. Thanks. Let's see if there's any other questions in the chat. Um, surprisingly, not. Um, though I'm sure there will be more um, that will arise um, coming soon. So you've got the get involved slide there in front of you. There's another briefing coming up on the. 28th of August on Ignition, so there's another opportunity um, to connect and ask more questions. There'll be uh, multiple um, OKD working group um, notices coming out shortly. Um, so the first kickoff, as I mentioned, is going to be next week on July 31st at 9 a.m. Um, and we may change the date uh, and time based on um, the survey results to see, make sure we can fit everybody else this time zones and everything in, but we really did want to kick it off um, and get the conversation, especially about um, the interdependencies of uh, Fedora CoreOS and the OpenShift installer and some of the roadmap um, design um, questions um, more fully uh, formed and, and discussed. 
So please, if you can, um, watch for that notice on, for next week's meeting and do get involved. Um, we really appreciate um, both Benjamin and Ben coming today and explaining um, the, the basics of CoreOS. I'm sure we'll have more questions and we'll have you back again multiple times. Um, so this is, you know, I think it's, I think it's the next big thing for Fedora. I think this is, uh, you made a joke about self-driving AI cars and, you know, AI causing cars to crash, but I can totally see uh, Fedora CoreOS underneath the hood of um, self-driving cars. And so uh, it's going to be, it's going to be an interesting new world out there. Yeah. I mean, we already got system D in those self-driving cars. So this is the next logical step. That's fantastic. Uh, actually, uh, Benjamin, I've got a question for you to put you on the spot. Uh, you mentioned future uh, preview releases. Have um, Is there a cadence? We should expect those to come out, like uh, weekly, biweekly, monthly? Any any thoughts there? Oh, yeah. So um, the current target is to have each of those three streams that I mentioned release once every two weeks. Those are the scheduled releases. And then over and above that, if there's, a, let's say, a critical security fix that needs to go out immediately, then we can have uh, what we call out-of-cycle releases uh, to push those out quickly. Um, that is an initial target. Um, we're not, that's not uh, contractual, if you will. So we may choose to change that uh, cadence depending on how it actually works out. Um, at the moment, we are releasing a little bit more ad hoc because we're still um, sort of tinkering with the update infrastructure and that sort of thing. So I think for the next month or so, re releases will probably be a little bit irregular, but we plan to settle down to a, a two-week scheduled cadence after that. Perfect. How do you plan to enumerate them? Uh, going back to my other question, I assume it'll be disassociated with the current, you know, F30, F31 sort of thing. Yeah, the version numbering, um, there's actually a one or two small details that aren't nailed down about that yet, but the version numbering is very roughly um, Fedora major version dot date stamp dot counter. All right, then. Um, we are done at the end of the, not quite at the end of the hour, um, and I don't see any other questions. Um, I was also going to mention um, the OKD working group um, we'll be hosting a Google group. So not that you all need yet another mailing list, but um, we thought we would set aside a, a mailing list for the OKD working group so that if we had things that we wanted to vote on or weigh in on um, that were OKD specific, we would have that there as well. So look for all of that. And as someone asked, um, I will be posting these to the user and dev um, OpenShift um, mailing list and um, as well as to the commons mailing list. And so much. And then I will ask um, on the CoreOS Fedora project list, um, perhaps as well, things that are interrelated. We'll post any events and announcements there as well. So hopefully we'll keep the communication fire hose going until it annoys someone and they tell me to stop posting. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Thank you for setting this up, Dan. This is fantastic. Right. Well, no, this is this is great. Um, and as we all keep saying, the more feedback and the more issues you can post and give us on this, and the more insights into how you're using these um, projects, all of them, Ignition, Fedora CoreOS, uh, OKD, and a bazillion other things that um, are interrelated, the better we all will be in terms of getting good releases out. So thanks, guys. Thanks for coming, all. Yeah. Thank you.